uh, going to the format, as I just told you, we are going to follow the Dow University of Health Sciences Research Protocol. And this protocol uh, is sort of uh, in this way. It has a title page. Uh, the title page actually has the title of the study. And then you have to have the name of the student uh, or the uh, MSAPT uh, uh, enrollee. Uh, there's a principal investigator and there's a co-PI. Again, it all depends on the institute or the funding body. In some cases, uh, the researcher, although he or she is the one who is doing all the research, but since he's a young investigator or he's a student or the youngster, so they are taken as a co-PI. That is co-principal investigator. And the principal investigator is usually your supervisor or the senior person among the faculty who has been assigned to help you with the research uh, protocol or search proposal. So whatever is the policy of your own institute, you have to follow that regarding uh, selection of PI and co-PI. Apart from them, you have to name them, uh, mention the name of the department, the institute, and your own affiliation and, your, uh, and uh, what is your uh, career standing. Now we are going to discuss each one of them in a little bit more detail, uh, starting from the title of the research protocol. So again, uh, obviously, this uh, title is the first thing that everyone reads, whether it is a research article, whether it is a research protocol, or whether it is a research thesis or dissertation. So you need to understand it should be specific to the research that you're going to undertake. Uh, generally, you should avoid using abbreviation in the title. But if it is important or it is very well known, for example, like age or TV, you might want to use it. But again, please uh, follow and refer back to the instruction which are issued by your own university or your own department. Uh, it is recommended both for the article manuscript and both for the research dissertation type uh, and protocols that if possible and if feasible, you should actually include the study design right in the title. It will guide the reviewer or your, the person who is going to read your article or dissertation or research protocol to understand what kind of research protocol you are proposing. So for example, if your uh, research protocol is about a randomized controlled trial, it is a good idea to include the word randomized controlled trial in the title. If it's the cross-sectional survey, you might want to add the word cross-sectional survey. Uh, for example, uh, knowledge and attitudes of a physical therapist uh, towards stroke rehabilitation, a cross-sectional survey of 600 physical therapists from Karachi, or probably a, a comparison of kinesio taping versus early mobilization in management of hemiplegic shoulder pain or randomized control trial. So again, try to include the study design right in the title. Uh, introduction again has uh, different parts uh, and they could be background, literature review, rationale of the study, statement of the problem, objective, hypothesis, and operational definition. And we are going to discuss all of them in uh, detail one by one. So st starting from the background. So first of all, you give the background of the current problem or the issue or the disease which is being studied. Uh, for example, you are uh, trying to study uh, the role of uh, a, a technique A versus technique B in the management of spastic cerebral palsy. So you might want to actually start with a little bit of definition of what cerebral palsy is. Then you might want to give a little bit of background what cerebral palsy statistics are in Pakistan or in the region or maybe internationally. And then you might want to uh, address that particular technique that you are going to discuss while comparing, uh, while comparing uh, both of them. Then you might want to add the magnitude of the problem or the issue or the disease at hand. And here is where you actually give some little bit of uh, statistics and epidemiological data. And if there's no data available in your own setup, you might want to say it upfront that, you know, like again, the same case of uh, cerebral palsy. So actually you can say that that uh, 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 cerebral palsy registries are available in developing countries like uh, Northern America and Europe and Australia and data of uh, hundreds of thousands of patients with cerebral palsy is available. But unfortunately in Pakistan, there is no central registry or there is no large scale epidemiological data available on the demographics or clinical pattern of spastic cerebral palsy. And then actually uh, this actually shows that there is a research gap even in identifying the epidemiological pattern of cerebral palsy. And there's so many other diseases and disabilities which are not very well researched in developing countries like Pakistan. And whenever you write a background like this, it actually shows that this is an important problem that has been studied in, studied in different parts of the world, but is being neglected in this particular part of the world. So it becomes important. And again, as per the instruction uh, of the UHS, it should be approximately be one pager. Uh, 
Uh, then you have to mention the literature review again. Now you might want to review the lecture on literature review again. And here, what you need to know that you know a thorough, a good literature review, which we discussed earlier in our previous lectures, it allows the researcher to become familiar with what is already known about the problem and to be aware of both the supporting and opposing point of view. Again, you need to understand that whatever you are going to discuss, what is already published on that particular problem or disease or technique in the literature first of all you need to know that then you always you know uh, 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 remember that you know there's nothing like absolute truth in science or specifically in medical sciences so whenever a new technique comes in whenever a new disease comes in whether it is the pathophysiology of the disease or whether it's a management strategy of the disease there are always two opposing schools of thought so there might be a school of thought that says that drug a or technique a is better in this disease and there could be an opposing school of thought that says no, not drug A, but drug B or technique B is better. So literature review will allow you to have a holistic view of both the uh, uh, for and against uh, 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 for and against views on that particular disease or that particular problem. And you also need to know that whenever you write a literature review or whenever you write a background, you have to connect your current research to the research done in the past. And again, a literature review will provide you insight into the research done in the past. It would give you information on the previous tested hypothesis that which of the hypothesis was proven wrong so that you don't like uh, start reinventing the wheel, which was the hypothesis that has been established beyond any doubt so that you don't again start redoing the work that has been established and you might want to do something new or different. Then, you know, it will, uh, a literature review will also give you a lot of insight into uh, operational definitions, which are an important part of this research protocol. It might actually give you a lot of food for thought on data collection instruments. We are going to discuss this, that a lot of uh, data collection tools and surveys are already available in the literature. So instead of making your own uh, data tool or you're validating it and then like, spending a lot of time on that, why not to do a thorough literature search? and then uh, sort of like uh, choose the best available uh, data collection tool available there, get the approval of the corresponding author, and then after modification, start using it for your own research. So it will going to save you a lot of time. And this is only possible if you do a thorough literature search. Then again, literature review will also uh, inform you that what is the most appropriate research design, which is applicable to the research problem that you want to uh, uh, study. Uh, again, uh, there's no uh, hard and fast rule, but what I would recommend that you should organize uh, your literature review uh, in uh, three uh, categories. Or you can say like, uh, you don't like give subheadings, but you know, it must or it should ideally encompass all three. Uh, please do give uh, reference to international studies, but please do not uh, forget to reference your own regional studies and the local literature. Now it actually sometimes becomes very annoying that you know the researcher or the student just submit your research proposal and uh, research dissertations and thesis, and they have uh, a lot of material and data from the developed world. Uh, they have a lot of data and article and referencing and literature search from uh, US, UK, or Europe and Australia and Japan stuff like that. Uh, it's absolutely important because we need to know what's happening in other parts of the world. But it's also equally important to know what is happening in your own region. So for example, Pakistan is in Southeast Asia, so I need to know that what's happening in India, Bangladesh, Iran, China, Afghanistan. You know? and, and also important is that you need to know and you need to reference and you either need to identify and reference or you need to identify and say it that there is or there's no local literature available on that particular disease or research that you are planning. So it's very, very important. And again, the recommendation are it should be approximately of two page uh, length. Uh, rationality of the study, uh, again, uh, in simple word, it is uh, not yet known and what is still unanswered. Question related to your topic and why your study is important and what it adds to the current pool of knowledge. It might be a bit difficult for you to understand. I'm going to explain it in, uh, like, uh, uh, in detail uh, just after the slide. Excuse me, just give me a second. Okay, it should be one paragraph, okay? Now there's a difference between rationality of the study and statement of the problem. And I'll give you an example and that might make it easier for you to understand. So statement of the problem is actually a single declarative or inquisitive sentence stating the research question. For example, 
what is the effect of early mobilization in patient with stroke now this is a simple statement of the problem so you would start by uh, probably defining what is a stroke and uh, what is the role of early mobilization what is what does literature says about this particular problem and what are the studies available in literature on this particular problem and then you can after go, giving a rationale you come to the statement of the problem and the statement of the problem would be what is the effect of early mobilization in patient with stroke aim and objective is going to be a bit more uh, clear uh, 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 like a description of the statement and now you have So aims and objective would be in clear measurable terms. For example, the aims and objective of this statement can be converted into to study the effect of early mobilization within 72 hours of onset of stroke in improving functional outcomes after acute ischemic stroke. Uh, please note, I have given you clear measurable terms. I have defined what do I mean by early mobilization. So my definition of early mobilization for my research is within 72 hours of onset of stroke, number one. And how do I define improvement? I'm going to define improvement by documenting improvement in the functional outcome. And I'm going to describe and define this functional outcome later on in my operational definition. And I am specifically targeting acute ischemic stroke. Now we know that a stroke can be ischemic and can be hemorrhagic, but I am specifically targeting patient with acute ischemic stroke. So you know, now can you see this? This was a simple statement. What is the effect of early mobilization in patient with stroke? This was the statement of the problem. And once you convert into clear measurable terms like early mobilization within 72 hours, one measurable term, uh, improving functional outcome, second measurable term, after acute ischemic stroke is a third measurable term. So this is how you would write your aims and objective when it comes to your research protocol. But you will not stop there, then you have to generate a hypothesis. And now, what is hypothesis? Hypothesis is an HQE, an educated guess. It might be this, it could or might not be this. It is a proposition. I propose that early mobilization in stroke within 72 hours is going to improve the functional outcome in acute ischemic stroke patient. It's a hypothesis. It might be correct, it might be incorrect. Uh, okay, Kiran, uh, we are going to take the answers in the end. So please uh, you just pass your question here and we'll do the question answer session in the end, inshallah. Okay. okay, so hypothesis can be an educated guess. It could be a proposition or it could be a principle that is posted by the researcher for purpose of testing. And we all know that we generate a hypothesis and then we test it in the field by doing research. And again, you please uh, remember both falsified and verified hypothesis. That is both the true hypothesis and the null hypothesis. They advance science and they contribute to the global pool of scientific knowledge. So it's not important that whether whatever hypothesis that you have proposed has been proven right or wrong. The important thing that matters is, is your methodology strong and rigorous and are your results replicable? If this is the case, then your hypothesis is going to add to the global pool of knowledge. And then you have to study, uh, uh, you have to mention the study hypothesis or both the null hypothesis. So for example, in this case, you might want to uh, 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 propose a hypothesis, early, mobili early mobilization after stroke within 72 hours improve functional outcome. This would be your study hypothesis. And your null hypothesis would be that early mobilization within 72 hours of onset, onset of stroke does not improve functional outcome. That's going to be a null hypothesis, which is going to be tested in the field once you do the research. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Operational definitions. <clears throat> Operational definitions are the one which explain the terms in observable and quantifiable language so the reader or the reviewer clearly understands the terminology used in the research proposal. For example, 
taking the same example stroke so how would you define stroke or which patients would you consider as stroke so you your your operational definition of stroke might be that it is a focal persisting neurological deficit that for uh, that persists beyond 24 hours so it might be uh, your operational definition of stroke uh, then you might want to define for example functional outcome and you might want to describe functional outcome in terms of motor recovery or something else so whatever you want to dis uh, describe you have to give a reference from an article that, that this definition has been referenced or quoted from this particular article uh, and again, you can also say that an operational definition is how the researcher decides to measure the variable in the study. So, for example, again, the same thing. Uh, your operational definition could be uh, how would you define severity of pain? So, you might want to use a visual analog scale.